share button. I believe God has a word for you. In just a moment, we are going to get into some worship, but I do have a thought to share. In John chapter 4, Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well, and when she perceives Jesus to be a prophet, she asks Jesus, our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus replies to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He goes on to say this, but the hour is coming and is here right now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seek, see, uh, seeking such people to worship Him in spirit and truth. So I want to let you guys know, the Spirit of God is here today and is going to fill you up right now if you allow Him. So let's get ready for God to move because I believe He's going to do something spectacular today. So if you guys can come again and join me right now, Lord, we pray for your spirit to move. We're excited to be here, Lord God. 
and we just want to be touched by you, Lord. We pray that you take care of the entire service. We are hungry for you, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you transform us and change us. But we thank you that we can come together just to worship and honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. We give you praise, we give you praise. Oh, we give you praise. We lift your name. We glorify you, Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. Come on, church, sing it with me. As the Spirit was moving over the water. Come on, sing it with me. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving.
out your own words. Come on, just a couple moments. Come on, press in. Come on. The Spirit of the Lord is here and He wants to move. Father, we press in tonight. Come on. Come on. With expectations. We come with expectation tonight. Come on. Father, we come hungry. We come hungry. We don't want to leave the same. We don't want worship to be the same. We come hungry for more. 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 Come on. We press in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. We're hungry for more. We're hungry for more. We're hungry for more. Oh, we're hungry for more. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. Come feel the room. Like a rushing wind. Like a rushing wind. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. Cause you're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. You're all we want. You're all. more time tell him you're all we want you're all we want Holy Spirit. 
won't make it personal To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to Yes, I will make room for you, Jesus To do whatever you want to To do whatever you want to King is in the room tonight. Let us be aware of his presence tonight. His mighty presence. His mighty presence. That brings so much healing. So much comfort. So much peace tonight. The mighty one is in the room. We just fix our eyes on Him Let us fix our eyes on Him The King of glory The King of glory The King above all kings Oh, we love you, Lord Oh, 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 yes The mighty
to thank him in this place we thank you lord we thank you lord i thank you lord your love surrounds me your love never fails me your love never leaves me oh it never forsakes me i thank you lord i've known your mercy i've known your grace father who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord? Oh, just sing with me. 
Lord, Father God, you deserve the highest praise, Lord. Miracle worker, chain breaker, our healer, our comfort, our strong tower, our place of refuge, our comfort. We thank you, Father God. Thank you for being a God of freedom, a God of victory, Lord. We thank you for shaping and molding us, Lord. Help us tonight, Father, to draw closer to you, Lord. We pray against every distraction tonight, Lord. We ask, Father God, that you give us clarity. Help us to receive tonight, Lord. I pray wherever anybody's at tonight, Lord, if they're doing good or they're doing bad, Father, I pray they just surrender to you tonight, Father. I pray that they don't leave the same that they came tonight, Lord God. So we thank you, Father. We pray for the speaker tonight, Lord. Anoint his lips, Lord. Help our minds to hear, Lord. Help our hearts to receive you, Father God. So we thank you right now, Lord. We pray for the newcomer, Lord. We pray for those that fell away, Lord. We ask right now, Father God, for salvations, transformations, Lord. So we thank you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray. Amen. Welcome to Reach Church. Please reach back. You greet your neighbor. Amen. Welcome to Reach Church. We are so glad you're here with us today. If it's your first time here, text NEW to 562-418-5103. We love to connect with you and let you know more about what's happening here at our church. On Friday nights, there's a place for you. For ages 12 to 18, we have Reach Youth that meets here at the church. Across our community, we have connect groups for all ages. Getting involved in one of these groups is a great way to build strong relationships here in our church. To find a group near you, visit our website. All of these groups start at 7.30 p.m. Every Saturday at 8 a.m., we join together for prayer. We pray for our church, community, and each other. We are seeing God move in amazing ways every week. We'll see you then. To give and continue to support our church and ministry, you can give the following ways. Online at reachparamount.com give, or you can text to give at 562-206-1519. For up to the minute information, upcoming guest speakers, and other events happening at our church, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Reach Paramount. Well, good evening, Reach Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see each and every one of you. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in the house tonight. How many of you feel the presence of God in the house tonight? All right, well, some of you over there. Well, you guys, uh, you guys will get with it here. Uh, you have, a, uh, we're all in for a special treat. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Rob Santiago is going to be ministering tonight. Uh, fresh off a. Fresh off a of vacation, and so he's he's ready to go tonight. You guys are, uh, we're all in for a special treat. But uh, we do want to welcome any first-time guests. If you're here uh, in the house, reach Paramount for the very first time. If you would, just wave your hand at me. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and say anything. Anybody at, at all here for the very first time? Anybody? Uh, got a young man here that, that's here for the first time. We appreciate, we appreciate you being with us here uh, tonight. And we understand there's a lot of different things you could be doing with your Wednesday night, so we're honored that you chose to be here with us. Uh, we also want to welcome those that are joining us online on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, about 40 people uh, are with us online, so why don't we give our online congregation a big hand. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being with us here tonight. Um, we do live stream our services here on Wednesday, our 9 o'clock service on Sunday, our prayer services on Saturday. Help us, uh, those of you uh, that may, be, may not be doing it, help us rebroadcast that. You could just, uh, you could like it, you could share it, you could repost it, you could uh, send it to, uh, to uh, friends, family, whoever that is. But help us get the word out and uh, ultimately we're not trying to prop up. Uh, a church or a, a certain personality or anything like that. We want to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is one of those avenues, uh, one of those vehicles that we could use. So we appreciate all of you that help us out with that. We're excited for this Sunday. We're, we're going to have a special, we call him a guest, but really it's like family. Uh, Pastor Ron Simpkins is going to be with us. And uh, those of you that know Pastor Ron uh, know uh, how rich his ministry in. Uh, is uh, those of you that maybe you've never heard Pastor Ron Simpkins minister, he's a tremendous teacher. Uh, he's an author, a church planter, uh, really gifted, 
Uh, and so we're, we're really honored to be able to have him with us this Sunday. And so I encourage you not to miss out on that. Invite somebody. Uh, those of you that have heard, uh, we call him Uncle Ron around here, but uh, those of you that have heard him understand how unique uh, really his, his, uh, his teaching is and his ministry is. And so we're honored to be able to have him here uh, this, uh, this Sunday. Lastly, I would ask you, uh, to keep our pastors in prayer, Pastor Omar and Sister Letty, our, our senior pastors, they're away on vacation, uh, 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 much needed, earned, and well-deserved vacation, and so uh, uh, they're away with family uh, over the next couple of days, and so let's just pray for them that they have a time of refreshing and uh, uh, traveling mercies and all of that good stuff. You guys good with that? Amen. Well, we're going to give God, why don't we give God a big praise here, and our ushers are going to come forward, and as you heard... On the announcement video, there are several ways you could give online. Uh, you could give by text. Also, uh, if you're writing out a check, you can make that payable to Reach Network. We appreciate your generosity and your liberality. Uh, if you need an offering envelope, maybe you want to give by cash or uh, you want to fill out uh, fill out the card and give with a debit card. We could process that uh, privately and securely. Just lift your hand and the ushers will get it, will get it to you. But uh, I first want to say uh, uh, and, and honor really this house, a generous house, truly a generous house and, and uh, uh, appreciate uh, your generosity and your faithfulness to God. And I want to tell you this. I always feel like it's important that I, uh, I secure, you know, God's blessing and promises and, and tie it to what we do. And so uh, in the Bible, it says that there's no begging for the righteous. I'll say that one more time. There is no begging for the righteous. And so God's promises, God promises blessings on the righteous, uh, on, on those that are righteous. And so Psalms 37, 23 through 26 out of the Living Bible. Many of you know this, uh, this passage, but I want to share it with you. The Bible says that the steps of good men or women are directed by the Lord. He delights in each step they take. Verse 24, if they fall, it isn't fatal. For the Lord holds them with his hand. 25, I have been young and now I'm old. So this is someone saying, you know, talking, I've, I've lived a long life. And in all my years, I have never seen the Lord forsake a man who loves him. How many of you appreciate that promise? My goodness. Uh, goes on to say, nor have I seen the children of the godly go hungry or the righteous go hungry. Verse 26, instead, the godly or the righteous are able to be generous with their gifts and loans to others and their children are a blessing. How, how many of you appreciate that promise? And, and I, as I think about this, many of you have experienced this in your life, uh, that God has been good to you and in your generosity and your faithfulness to God, that God seems to always come through right when you need it. How many of you have experienced that? It's just like, my goodness, right at, 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 right at the right time. God opened the door and everything and, and, and worked everything out. And really this promise is that uh, as, as we are righteous, and what that means is following the laws of God, following the principles of God, and being generous not only with our time, not only with our talent, but also with our finances. As God has blessed each and every one of us, given us the ability to go and earn a living for our families, that we stay in line with the law and the principles of God and bringing the tithes and the offerings into the house. And so uh, we could all experience uh, really the blessing of God. And, and I, I say this often, we say this often, is that all of this that happens, the lights that are on, the doors that are open, the ministry that goes forward, not only from this pulpit, but in our, in our kids' church and through our youth, all of that is made possible by a people that are generous, that understand the vision of reaching more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and give to that, not only understand it, but also give to that. And all of that is made possible. And so we, we honor you th uh, tonight and we thank you for your generosity. As you're preparing your gift uh, this, uh, tonight, uh, and again, several ways you can give, I'm going to ask if you would stand with me. And uh, we do this uh, every time we, we take an offering, but we want to pray. And I really, I want to pray the blessing of God over your, your life. Uh, the Bible says, again, that the righteous... Uh, carry this blessing that not only you will be blessed, not only uh, God will take care of you, but generationally your children will be blessed as well. And so I want to I, I want to seize that promise here tonight. And uh, as I pray, I'm going to ask you to pray with me as well. We're going to believe God tonight. So pray with me, church. Father, we just thank you, Lord, tonight. We thank you. 
God, for your promises. We thank you, God, for your principles, Lord. And we understand, God, that we're never forsaken, God. You never fail us. You've come through time and time and time again. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would trust you in the area of our finances, God, that as we follow your principles, as we follow your laws and your decrees, as we give generously, God, we know, Father, that you'll take care of us, not only us, but God, but you'll take care of generations to come. And so, Father, I pray a blessing upon your people as we put you first in our tithes and offerings, God. I pray, Lord, that there would be promotion and favor, Father, upon your people. We honor you tonight, and we thank you in Jesus' name. If you agree with that prayer, say amen. Amen. So I'll throw my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all I have is a hallelujah and hallelujah. I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king except for a horse singing. tonight. Thank you so much for that. I'm excited to be here with all you. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say, uh, I want to say thank you to my pastor um, and, just, and just what a blessing him and, and, and Letty are into my life, my wife's life. They've been a blessing to us so much. And, and for me to preach here in front of you all fine folks and to those of you online, I'm blessed. I, I am so blessed. I never thought my life would be something like this. I never planned for it. So if you're sitting there, you know, thinking I could never do that or I don't think my life would ever amount to that, I'm going to be honest, you're limiting God is what you're doing. And, and I just want to encourage you all to, to continue to just strive, continue to be in church, continue to worship God, continue to think about Him. Don't think about anybody else. Don't try to impress other people. Just try to impress the King of Kings. Amen? I also want to thank my beautiful wife. We just celebrated 15 years of being married. We had a, we had a wonderful time, and, and we went to Hawaii, and um, honestly disconnected and hiked up mountains, believe it or not, hiked up mountains, uh, went swimming at beaches, and uh, it was just amazing. I was depressed coming back. I, I'm just kidding. No, I, I knew I was preaching. I'm like, man, I, I got to start writing something, and I just started praying and ask, asking God, even throughout my vacation, Lord, give me something. Give me something to preach on Wednesday night. I want to I wanna be ready, amen? Um, so uh, I also want to just announce, just a quick announcement. Uh, we are starting our Reach Bible Institute next Tuesday. So I'm, I'm very excited. We're going to be talking about a class I call, I've been teaching for years. Uh, it's every Tuesday at, at 7 p.m., okay? And we're going to brief. It'll be free donuts, free coffee, free class, free Bible reading. I mean, it's all free, okay? And so I'm going to be talking about bibliology. It's basically how the Bible is structured. And so I know a lot of us are reading the Bible, but we don't know what it is really. We don't know how it was put together, how it was structured, how it was inspired. And we're going to be going over that for the next six weeks. Also, the second half of every Tuesday, we're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse reading through Ephesians. Okay, we're going to read verse-by-verse -verse together. I know a lot of us probably picked up a Bible and someone said, hey, read that. But no one sat with you and actually read it right? When you read with other people, you'll start to download ways of interpretation and understanding. So I encourage you all, 
be a part of that. Next Tuesday, we start for six weeks at 7 p.m. Is that all right? Amen. With that, I'm going to open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, I ask that your word would go forth and not my voice. Father, that people would listen to your voice, Lord. That it would be by your agenda that people are changed, that lives are affected because of your Holy Spirit. We thank you and we honor you this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. So as, as all of you know, we're in this series called Scorekeeper. And, and when I think about Scorekeeper, I think that you could be keeping score through, you're keeping score through other people, right? Family members, friends. I'm going to say it, spouses, right? We can keep score between our, our horizontal relationships, is what I like to call it. And then we keep score with our vertical, right? Our vertical relationship, our relationship with God the Father, right? We, we, we tend to do that. That's in our DNA, is we like to keep score. You may hear yourself say, well, this person doesn't do that for me. Why am I going to do that for them? Has anyone said that? I'm the only one. I'm going to preach to myself tonight, all right? Or, hey, why do they expect me to do that? But then when I ask them to do something, you guys ever have that behavior? Am I the only one with attitude tonight? If I'm the only one with attitude tonight, it's going to be a long night for you, okay? But I'm just saying, it, it happens, right? We say things like that. It may be at work, right? Well, that department, I'm not helping that department. I don't like the way they treat my boss, right? We, we do those things, and... And, and, but tonight, you know, we keep score, but I think, and, and that what I think the heart of it is, and I, and I think it's the fabric of keeping score, I think it's the foundation, and I, I think it stems from envy. So tonight, I want to talk about envy, and I'm, I'm going to talk about, and I titled this sermon, The Secret of Envy, because the secret of envy is important. It's an emotion that is very secretive. So you may sit there, right, and you, you, you know, you, 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 you may see somebody and then you have this feeling inside of you and, and you're looking at that, but you're not telling everybody how you feel. You're not telling people like, oh, I'm envious of that person. If you said that, well, power to you, but if you're being so honest, but we don't do that. It's kind of a secret. We, what we do is we harbor it, we close it up, and we just let it sit there. And say, oh, okay, it's there. And you know what the problem is? Is that envy is the emotion that we tend not to take care of. Right? Because it's not external. It's, it's internal. It is something that's happening inside of you. It's a feeling that is beginning to creep up inside of you. And so we say, we suppress it. We don't let it come out. But how many, how many know that when you start to suppress feelings, they don't go away? So we never eventually take care of it. And so tonight I'm going to talk about how it's a secret. It's something that can begin to change your attitude. It changes your outlook. For example, I'm going to talk about myself for just a little bit, okay? I don't like certain NFL teams, okay? I'm the only one again, all right? Nobody else is like that in here. I don't like certain NFL teams. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll honestly, I'll be getting notifications to make sure they lose, Right? I, I, when I walk out of church, I'm really like, oh, did they lose? Oh, they won? <laughs> right? And then, I, and then I go and I run and say, did my team win? And I look like, oh, my team lost. And then you're like, dude, we're in trouble. And I'm like, man, I hate that team. And it just grows. That team did nothing to your team. But it just grows. And all of a sudden, you know, the season's going along. I'm, I'm mostly talking. I know women, if you can understand, you know, power to you. But as the season goes along, you're just like, man, I hope. I hope that team loses, man. You know, and, and if the team beats your team, you're like, man, I didn't like the way they beat us. Right? And so you're just like, you're hoping and holding on, hoping that they fail. Right? Everyone's like, wow, because you know exactly. I, I, I'm not the only one, right? Everyone's like, wow. Yeah. And, and then you just realize, I can never root. You hear that? I can never root for that. Right, And I don't mean to pick on the Raiders, but a lot of the Raider fans. <laughs> hey, look, I miss my pastor, okay? A lot of the Raider fans, they hate Tom Brady. And I'm like, because of one play. If you know the history of that play, it's the tuck rule. And all of a sudden, it's Tom Brady's fault that he 
won. Well, yeah, it's his job to win. But the call in the field, it could have it could have gone either way, I'll be honest. But the call in the field, those of you that know that scenario, right? And so you go on hating him for years to the point where people and journalists call it the curse. Now there's a curse. Oh, they haven't won anything since that play. And it just, and what that does is it just builds up that envy. And everybody starts calling Tom Brady the goat, the greatest of all time, right? And then the Raider fans are just like, no way is he the goat. Just that envy begins to seep out, right? And the envy just comes out and, it, you know, but there, I'm, not all Raider fans are like that, okay? I'm just, I'm just, there's just, that's just a good scenario for my example, but they're not all like that. Some are really good football fans and they actually, you know, they appreciate Tom Brady, as you should. You should appreciate greatness, okay? You should appreciate blessings, even though they're not yours, okay? Even though they're not yours, but listen, envy is a dangerous place to be. It could ruin you. It makes things unenjoyable. It makes circumstances awkward for you. But for whatever reason, we keep it a secret. But here's this, in James chapter three, verse 16, it says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. I'm gonna read that again. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. When I think about that, we're like, well, that's kind of harsh. We may read our Bibles really fast and gloss over that. But really what's being said there is that when you, when you have that jealousy or that envy, or you have this selfish ambition that you're nurturing, in other words, you are nurturing something vile after that. You are unleashing something greater, okay? And so envy, here's a definition, is about yearning for someone else's blessings when you are supposed to be content enjoying yours. And I think sometimes what takes place is we look at other people, what they have, we look at their blessings, and we're saying, where's mine? How come I've been serving God longer? How come I don't have that? How come they're always getting success in their life and I'm not? How come I can't be like them? And it's the art of comparison. We're all really good at that. The art of comparison. Some of us all went to that college and got our degree to compare ourselves with everybody. We just think, hey man, it, this is the, I gotta, I gotta be like this person. I gotta be like that person. But I wanna read a scripture. It'll be our main passage this evening in 1 Samuel chapter 18. You can go ahead and turn there if you have your Bibles or you have an app that you wanna look at this scripture with me. I'm gonna give you some historical context of what's happening in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Um, the bigger picture is Israel begged for a king. God didn't want to give them a king. God wanted to give them prophets. God wanted to give them something better than a king, but they begged for a king, and so Samuel anoints Saul as a king. Saul becomes this prideful king. Okay, Saul is like, just picture this prideful person, and he was a man that was, that was in the light of the Lord, but then he became disobedient. As he began to grow, he began to grow in his pride, and then he started to realize, you know, I don't, I don't need to respond to everything that the Lord has asked me to do. So Saul gets this label in scripture, which we'll read a little bit later, of being disobedient. But there was this young man named David who was very handsome, the Bible says, very strong. He was younger, and he begins to make an impact. He begins to have a lot of influence on the people. Those of you know, David versus Goliath, he takes down the giant, the Philistine, the biggest obstacle, and people begin to cheer him. Samuel anoints David secretly. God begins to look at David with favor. And secretly, Samuel, the priest, begins to anoint David as king because Saul was disobedient. It was done in secret. Saul, in other words, begins to see David and he begins to look at him in a particular way. So I want to read and pick up this scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I believe we're going to start at verse 6. It says, When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, 
The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with uh, timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully onto Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall, but then David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him a command over a thousand men and led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw, saw how successful he was, he became afraid of him. See, there's something I wanna bring out to you. There was some scoring there. I don't know if you caught it, right? It said Saul slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands, and Saul begins to repeat that. It starts to make him feel a little uneasy, right? Here's what it begins to take place, and this is my first point. Envy will keep you from seeing blessings in your life. Let me explain something to you. They're on the same team. They're on, the, they're on the same team. And what begins to take place is Saul starts to look at David and he begins to look at him as a problem rather than a success. And I know a lot of us here, those of us that are in ministry, we have to work together, right? We have to have unity. But sometimes there's a little friction between us. But we're on the same team. See, envy keeps you from seeing an individual as a blessing and instead it shifts your thinking, it crosses your wires, and you see them as a problem in your life. See, envy, you can't see blessings. But guess what? When you can't see blessings, guess what also you don't see? You don't see the creator. When you can't see blessings, when you can't identify things as blessings, and you're being held from seeing those things, it separates you from the kingdom. See, and the one thing that I get to do is, and my pastor, I'm gonna quote him on this. My pastor, he, he preached about this, I believe, last year. He preached about gratefulness a lot last year. And I love this because he says, what keeps me going is my gratefulness. In other words, he's grateful for the blessings that he sees. But not only his blessings, he's grateful for your blessings. In other words, when we, how about, has anyone ever, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this story. I remember, I was, I was really praying, I said, Lord, I want a house. What's up, man, what's going on here? I've been serving you for a long time now. I live in California, so I need a miracle. Right, and so I, I said, I need a house, and I see everybody buying a house. In my head, it was everybody. Everybody but me, anyone been there? Right? Everyone but me. And so I'm like, God, what's going on, man? And I, I told myself, like, man, I, I, you know, I guess I just got to wait, man. I got to continue to be, you know, a good steward. <laughs> and I know, I know he blesses people. I've been blessed before. He's got to do it again. I didn't get my final blessing here. <laughs> right? And so I'm con these are the things I'm thinking about, you know, like, so when is it going to happen for me? You know, and so I, I remember um, a brother, you know, he, he got a house. And I'm like, he got a house? Where are you living at? That's a nice neighborhood. They got good schools there. How? Really? And I'm like, man, I'm like, what the heck, God? And I'm starting to like, I'm realizing that, hey, that's the little envy inside of me. In other words, I had to change my attitude, and I learned, you know, I got to change your attitude, Rob. You, you, can't be, you, you can't be all negative about somebody else's blessing. So you know what I said? I said, man, I'm so happy for you. I said, God is so good. 
And I said, you know what? I remember saying this, I want a house like that. I said, I'm so proud of you, man. And I'm, I, as I continued to say it, and I'm just telling you this, is, this is my experience. As I continued to say it, I felt way better about it. I said, God is moving in your life, dude. Look at that. The favor is all over you, man. That is so awesome. Right? Then, the, then they're like, you know, 15 houses later. <laughs> and that's what it felt like, okay? Every, you know, I, I kept saying the same thing. Man, that's awesome. You got your place. That is so great, man. It, you know, that, that is so amazing. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys deserve it. And you start to speak life. You start to begin to just fight that feeling instead of just going after and saying, God, look, at, here's my blessings and then here is theirs. And you're looking at it and you're like, God bless them, right? You have to do that. If you look at it any other way, you're dishonoring. You're dishonoring yourself. You're dishonoring them. But more importantly, you start to dishonor God. Because you're not looking at the blessings correctly because the envy has saturated you and it has become a fabric in front of your face. It has become a veil to where you can't even see the blessings that God has given you. We have a motto here. It's called Honor 360. You honor up, you honor down, and you honor all around. My pastor says that. And we have to do that. Guess what? You have to do that in the blessings. So stop counting other people's blessings. Start counting yours. And trust in God. This is something that we begin, we have to celebrate each other. We have to celebrate praise reports. We have to celebrate testimonies. We have to celebrate when people are up here giving a word. When people are growing in ministry. We have to celebrate it. We honor it all the way around. We don't look at a brother that's preaching up here like, why is he up there? When am I going to get my shot? Where's Pastor Rob at? It doesn't work that way. And, and you know, we, we have to treat each other a little bit differently. And envy's not going to let you do that. It's going to make it sting a little bit. But in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, you are not going to receive the blessing unless you see the blessing in other people. So you begin to activate that. You're letting this envy begin to creep in. And it's just an anchor to your spirituality and the blessings that God has for you. In James chapter three, verse 14 through 16, it says, but if you harbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your heart to do not boast about it or deny the truth. The truth, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So when I talk about envy, did you know that that is a, a demonic feeling? I know a lot of us are scared of demons, but when we begin to harbor that envy and we don't take care of it, you're just harboring that. You're taking care of that little thing. And you want to feel that way and you want to look at people with nastiness, like, you know, looking at them with the eye, just like Saul, just like Saul was doing to David. You're kind of like looking at them, seeing, keeping score, seeing what they got, seeing how they treat you so you could treat them the same. Is that how we're supposed to act with each other? Right? If someone's not treating you good, that doesn't mean you treat them bad. Bible, you know, the Bible tells you to turn the other cheek, Right? So we have to be able to take, we have to be punching bags. I love saying this, I say this a lot. We have to be punching bags. You gotta be tough. You know the tough guys that look tough, but then you insult them and they go, hey, you're not that tough, you're already hurt. Right? That, my definition of toughness is somebody can slander me and it's not gonna offend me. Right? That's just, that's just how it is. And for those of you in the ministry, you need to get tough. I've been slandered a lot. As well, like, what? Really? Yeah. I've gotten some pretty bad text messages <laughs> from some of you in this room. Right? 
Doesn't mean I stop reading my Bible. Right? Doesn't mean that I don't keep going for the kingdom. Right? I know the strategy of the enemy. I don't look at that person and say, oh, okay. I look at that person like, look, they're having a bad day. Something's going on with them. And by the way, if you slander me, you're going to get a phone call. <laughs> hey, we handle business in this church. If I hear you, are you talking about me? Like, hey, come here. You okay? You okay with me? I'm okay with you. Are, are we good? I'm good with you, but you're not good, you're not good with me. Okay, get it right. Because I'm good with you. I love you. I love you. This isn't going to tear us apart, so get it right. Call me. I'll buy you coffee. You come over. We'll play some video games. We'll get this out of the way. Right? I, again, you just want to harbor But sometimes we just want to harbor it like, oh, I've been, I haven't liked that person for years. Take care of that thing, man. You're... Man, that is an anchor to your spirituality. I love in James chapter 3, verse 14, it says bitter envy. And I love that word bitter. Because what I've learned about bitterness and what my pastor has taught me is that bitterness begins to grow. And you know what? It begins to corrupt everything about your body. It corrupts your perspective. It corrupts everything. It begins to tear down your soul. And so when it talks about bitter envy, it's almost like envy is the same thing. It grows. If you don't take care of it, it begins to grow and take over your mind. I'm going to read to you a Jewish parable I found. And I'm going to read it slow because it may be a little confusing to understand. It says this, a greedy man and an envious man met a king. The king said to them, one of you may ask something of me and I will give it to him provided I give twice as much to the other. So we have a greedy man and an envious man. The envious person did not want to ask first, for he was envious of his companion who would receive twice as much as him. And the greedy man did not want to ask first, since he wanted everything that was to be had. Finally, the greedy one pressed the envious one to be first to make the request. So the envious man asked the king to pluck out one of his eyes. Some of you got that. In other words, the greedy man's about to get two eyes gone. So in other words, they were, here, here's, a, here's the moral of the story. They failed to see the opportunity and the blessing because of what was in their heart. One of them was gonna get twice as much as the other. If, you, if it was your best friend, you'd be like, yeah, you know, give me this. So they get twice as much and celebrate them. But some of you, you would probably look at that just like this envious man and says, you know what? I don't want anybody to win. Take out my eye so he can have his two gone. And that's how envy works. It begins to shift your mindset. You be, it, it affects your decisions. It affects how you make decisions. You don't see opportunities. So in other words, my second point, envy enhances your self-righteousness. It's just... How many of you know that pride is, it's a big thing, right? Pride comes in and it begins to tear you down a little bit, right? It, it messes with you. You know, you, you know you're, the, you're, you're the coolest person in the room because you're prideful, right? But we know in scripture that pride does not play out very well. But it said this in verse nine of our text. It said, and from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall, but David eluded him twice. So here we go, we have Saul, right? And, and, and really what begins to take place is Saul, we know was a disobedient person. We know this from scripture. And so what ends up taking place is God gives him into his feelings. See, it said, the Bible said that Saul kept an eye on David. Why was he keeping an eye on him? To keep score. So he keeps an eye on David. So then God says, you know what? I'm gonna allow that evil spirit then. If that's how you're gonna react, then I'm gonna give you, give you into it. And so what, what Saul does is he thinks he's this amazing javelist. That's a real word. 
He picks up a spear and he tries to hit David with it. Okay, and so David eludes him, who's this younger, faster, handsome. We know this from scripture. David eludes him, right? But we see that this spirit that God gives him. See, separation from God is really gradual, church. It starts with a simple emotion. I'm gonna say it again. It starts with a simple emotion. That emotion will then breed comparison. Then that comparison will start to breed expectation or entitlement. Then it breeds the disobedience. Then God allows that desire, that separation. Look, if you're gonna go ahead and continue to have these feelings, you're gonna continue to harbor what's feeling in your heart, these negative feelings, then I'm gonna give you into it. So envy is a marinade to your disobedience. It's the seasoning to it. It's not only the fabric, but it begins to marinate you. And if you don't take care of it, you'll end up like Saul. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, it says, this is the passage we have. We have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Envy is that secret emotion that is keeping you and walking you in darkness. I, I, I tend, it's been a while since I said this, but you need to check yourself. You need to examine your heart, examine your emotions, examine your feeling. The enemy begins to operate and he plants seeds of envy, seeds of bitterness, and he begins to grow that inside of you. He'll use those two emotions to begin to separate you and segregate you from the kingdom, from the church. That's why sometimes, you know, oh, you know, you start talking, oh, that church down the street, they're better. How are they better? They have a better Bible? They got a better God over there? Right? Again, that's that envy that starts to seep in, right? Like, well, it's better because I'm not, I don't feel envious over there. I just, I feel more welcomed. Well, you're sitting here envious, bitter. Yeah, you're gonna feel better over there. Right? But we take our feelings with us, right? We we do that. In other words, I'm not telling you that, you know, the church down the street is, isn't better. It might, you know, there might be better things about it. They might do things a better way. But if you're harboring enviness and bitterness and you're upset and you're not taking care of it, it's not going to be much better over there after six months. It's just not going to happen. You, you ever do this where you're pointing the finger, but then you got like three pointing at you? Sorry, I didn't mean to offend anybody. Sometimes you're the problem. Can I be honest with you? That's okay. We serve a savior that is willing to forgive, fixes brokenness. God, that's what I love about my God. I can come to him all jacked up and broken and mad, jacked up, taking my envy and my bitterness to the altar, and I can feel better about it. My God makes me a better person. You know, and, and he could do the same for you. And, and it's okay. You don't have to be perfect. But be honest. Be honest with yourself. The next thing is envy keeps your mind busy and away from the things of God. Again, you are, we can become so cynical about people in our church. Saul, in, in, in verse 12 of our text, it says, Saul was afraid of David. Because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him a command over a thousand men. And David led troops into their campaign. And everything he did, David had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. His wires got all jacked up. When I was a young teacher and preacher, I wanted to be better than the next person. I have a competitive spirit inside of me. And so I wanted to be better, right? So when I see somebody take it up a notch, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna take it up a notch, <laughs> right? So I'm walking in there, like, I'm gonna take it up a notch. And then I realized I'm not doing this for the kingdom anymore, yeah. right? And so when I see somebody that's better, I had to realize quickly, you need to go and celebrate them. 
Can I be honest with you, church? Somebody's always gonna have a bigger house, better than you, right? It's always just gonna be better. And so I think we get caught up in the envy and we start to envy people that are better than us. And it, when in reality, we need to say, hey, you know what? I want what they have. And so I remember that I would look at teachers online as I would teach, I would try to get better. And I would say like, man, how are they doing that? How are they getting that much better? And then I realized like I would start to see speakers on the platform, other teachers within the fellowship, in the network. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna start talking to them. And I would start off with a compliment. Hey, you're an amazing speaker. How did you, what is your thing, man? Like, how can I be like that? You had to put everything aside and say, like, how do I, how do I learn that? Did you know that's what discipleship is? That's what discipleship is. It's putting that envious, the, the envious aside and saying, look, this person is way better at that. I gotta learn that. Can you teach me? Can you help me how to do that? Right? One of my favorite things is when a disciple asks, how did you do that? Can you show me? And I'm speaking for all the pastoral staff. When people tell us that, yeah, I could show you. You know, and it's like, you know, it, again, it, we have to celebrate each other. We are here to strengthen each other. We're not here to envy each other. We're here to honor each other. I say, hey, how do you do that? Can you show me how to do that? Can you, can you teach me? Instead of being envious, like, we need to break some boundaries in our lives. See, Paul's, or Saul's perspective was David was an enemy and not a shared success. Again, they were on the same team. Yes, Saul was older. Yes, he was a king. But he couldn't put the pride aside to ask David, let's do this together. Instead, he saw something specific. He saw that David was anointed. And Saul knew that he had not become anointed anymore. The Bible was explicit about that. He knew, I'm no longer anointed. So what did that bring? That brought fear into Saul. Listen, church, he understood that what the success was and what the source of that success was. But it made him afraid. That's how bad envy can mess you up. It crosses the wires. It gets you to think differently. Your oppor the opportunity is distorted because you're too busy keeping score. You're too busy worried about other people and you're not worried about your own relationship. You're too busy. Not only are we too busy in our own lives, but then you make your mind busy. You know, you come to church with an agenda, right? You come to church already planned out how you're gonna react to it. Some of you have made a decision, I'm never going to that altar. That's embarrassing. Let me tell you something. When people come to this altar, there's victory taking place. We, in this church, we celebrate that. We're not, oh, look at them. They're all jacked up. I know what they did. Why are they acting all holy? I've heard people say that. Why are they up at the altar? Why are they acting all holy? Did you, do you not know who God is? How he just breaks you in your seat sometimes? There's repentance happening here. This isn't fabricated to make your envy grow. It's not what it, that's not what God does. So stop looking at people that way. We need to celebrate that. You know, oh, why, why is she going around? Why is he going around praying? He told me off in the parking lot. She gave me a dirty look on the way in. Now she's praying for people. You're laughing because you've, you've said that in your mind. Again, why are you worried about that? You know, who cares who's praying? Somebody's getting touched, they're getting touched. Amen. It's, it, I think we get our wires crossed. In Galatians 5, 13, it says, for you were called for free, to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We need to serve one another. We honor 360. We need to celebrate, not be envious. You know, I'm going to paraphrase this. I, I have it written down. I was going to read it to you, but it's very long, and it's the story of Cain and Abel. Anyone, anyone ever read that story before? 
Okay, Cain kills Abel. Everyone understand that? He kills him. But why does he kill him? Well, uh, Abel is born. Cain was the firstborn. Abel's born. And then all of a sudden what takes place is they bring an offering to the Lord. And Cain was the first one to bring his offering. He brings God a couple berries from his, his harvest and some seeds. Okay, and then, but Abel, Abel brings like meat. He brings something nice. The Bible says he brings his first fruits. And he brings a lot of it. The Bible then clearly states that God begins to anoint and give favor to Abel. So Cain looks at Abel like, what the heck? Why does he get all that? Why does he get the blessing? Sound like anybody? Why does he get the blessing? Why does he get that? And so the Bible begins to say that Cain became so distraught that he has a conversation with God and God says, Cain, you need to understand that when you give something to me, I'm gonna bless it either way. But your brother gave more and he honored me more. So I'm giving him the favor. And so the Bible says that he begins, that God tells him, look, you're gonna wander in the wilderness because of your attitude. And so he's like, okay, well, if I'm gonna wander in the wilderness, I'm gonna get killed. That's what he says, is he's talking back to God now, right? This is the envy talking now. He's talking about, he's talking to the Lord. He says, well, I, I'm gonna get killed. And God says, no, 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 no one's gonna kill you. You're just gonna wander. Think about that. So the Bible doesn't really talk about what happens much after that. But Cain goes and he begins to wander. And the Bible doesn't really mention what happens to him. I believe that Cain goes off and he begins to wander and he's living with that envy. And I don't know if you know much about scripture, but he doesn't get mentioned ever again. It's almost as if his story ends that way. And it's a depressing story. We see Abel begin to get blessed. He gets favor. But Cain, on the other hand, he goes on wandering and he's like, well, then someone's gonna kill me. And he's like, no, no, no. You're gonna wander forever. You're gonna live in that envy forever. Imagine going to hell, burning and living because of envy. Being, you know, tortured to death. Living in that guilt. See, envy is a gateway to fall away, church. If you don't get anything out of this message, envy is a gateway to fall away. If you want to fall away, harbor some envy, drink a little bitterness, you'll fall away in, in no time. You'll fall away quickly. It'll separate you from the kingdom. Envy is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You're only killing yourself. You're only causing your own separation. While somebody continues to get their blessing and walk in honor, you're drinking poison hoping they die. It slowly deteriorates your heart from the love that God had put inside of you. Some of you have developed this envy. Some of you are living with it and you probably don't even know it. It's taking place because, remember, it's a secret. It's a secret emotion and it's an easy emotion to completely suppress. In other words, you could feel it briefly, suppress it, but never fix it. Never get rid of it. And then it begins to grow, you suppress it. It continues to grow, you suppress it again. And then you realize that it's been caused an illusion because you want what other people have, but you don't want to do the work to how they got it. Some of you still envy the world. Oh, I wish I never became a Christian. I could, wish I could down, you know, a six pack today. and Wish I could stay home and watch football on Sunday mornings. I wish I could do all these things, but I can't because I'm a Christian. That's envy. You're just envying the world. That's, that's probably the worst place you can be in. If that's you, I'd get that fixed immediately. Envy will cause you to look at the church as a distraction. Like, not right now, God. Come on, man. I got a lot of things going on at work. My business is booming. Doesn't have time for you, Lord. I've seen that a lot, too. 
hey, we're, you know, I understand you gotta work. Okay, I understand that we, there's situations where we have to do that. Not against that. But when you're positioning yourself for work success rather than spiritual success, you have a problem. And I think, I think we do that sometimes. We're so blinded by that. Oh, I have to work. I understand you have to, but is this an ongoing thing? You know, is this something that is gonna, you're gonna put before God? You're making that decision, right? And so in this church, what we try to tell people is like, we know you gotta work, but at the same time, you gotta be here. Because what begins to take place is all those things that you have inside of you that are secret emotions, they start to grow inside of you. And if you're not hearing God's word, you're not reading God's word, I'm gonna be honest, we could tell. We see it. Nah, I ain't reading the word. They don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, the only time they hear the word is, or they read the word is when you're reading it. You know, you gotta open up the book. You gotta, you gotta open up God's word and let it begin to take all that envy out. Let it begin to take all that, all that out. Envy. If you know your Bible, Satan became envious of God. Right? Envy. David saw Bathsheba became envious. Oh, I need her. Envy begins to tear down families. It destroys your spirituality. It destroys relationships. It can cause murder. Cain and Abel. Envy will cause divorce. You ever envy, envy your spouse because you feel like you're doing more than they are with the housework? Keeping score? In the home? Right? I, I get it, it happens, but we don't keep score. Because then it begins to grow, it causes divorce. Envy will distract you. Envy is what Satan has and he, he wants you to have it. And it will take you straight to hell. So how do you overcome it? You be honest with yourself. You be honest with yourself. There's some relationships in here, whether it's with your family or within here, brethren and sisters, there's some relationships in here that are built on envy. And we need to make those right. And even with your family, you gotta make phone calls. You gotta, you gotta be honest. You, you, gotta, you gotta recognize it. But you can't react to it. It can't be the emotion that you make decisions off of. You know, recognize that it's a heart issue. A lot of us have heart issues, church. Can I be honest? It's okay, be honest with yourself. We all have heart issues. We all need to get our heart fixed. All of us, including myself. It's okay to have heart issues. Don't let shame keep you away from being honest with yourself. Don't let embarrassment keep you from crying at the altar and repenting. Don't let those things happen. Some of us have probably you know, we've probably kept score on things we shouldn't have kept score on. But you know what I love about my Savior is he doesn't keep score. He settles the score. Jesus does not keep score. He settles the score. My God fulfilled the prophecies. He, res he resurrected and defeated death. And he gave us a cure for sin. He's 3-0 in my eyes. He'll never be defeated. And as long as I have him in my life, you have him in your life. You cannot be defeated. You cannot be defeated. If I can have every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. I know I talked about some heavy things about envy being one of them, but I also talked about secret emotions. And I believe that secret emotions are something that slowly take us and separate us from, from God and our, our salvation and our spirituality. But Maybe you're sitting there and you don't know Jesus is your personal savior. Maybe you don't know that he can actually make your life better. That he can begin to repair some of the heart issues that I talked about today. And so I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior and you've never accepted Christ before, I want you just to lift your hand. If you would like to make that declaration today, just lift your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you say anything. We just want to pray with you. Is there anyone at all? Anyone at all? 
Maybe you're sitting there and saying, you know, I have accepted Christ, but I, since I have fallen away, my relationship isn't the same as it used to be. And I've been harboring things. I, I probably have some heart issues and I need to get right with Jesus. I need to make him my number one again today. If that's you, if you'd like to rededicate your life to Jesus, just lift your hand. I don't want to pass through this. I feel like God is speaking to some people. You're feeling that heaviness in your heart. That's not me, that's, that's God. If you're feeling any type of anxiety, that's God telling you, he, you, know, you, you need to respond to this call. And so I believe that when we begin to confess as Jesus our, as our Lord and Savior before people, that confession is important for salvation. Is there anyone at all? Lift your hand. Again, I don't want to pass this up. I feel that this is the most important part of the service where God begins to move into people, begins to speak to them. Anyone at all, just lift your hand, church. Just lift your hand. So this evening, I talked about secret emotions. I believe some of us are harboring some secret emotions. I feel like there are things and relationships that are affected by envy, bitterness. And if that's you, you know, I'm not... I'm not telling you this out of embarrassment to come to the front, but I'm saying, be honest with yourself. And you want some prayer and you want to just get things right with God and ask him to, to fix the brokenness. I'm going to open up this altar. And if that's you, I want you to come to the front. Don't be embarrassed. I just want you to come to the front and just be honest with yourself this evening. I believe that there's people sitting there and say, you know, I, I don't know, Pastor Rob, I... I feel like I, I'm not an envious person. But I'm not just talking about envy. I'm talking about some secret emotions that you're harboring. Maybe it's not anything to do with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe it's something with family. Maybe it's a friendship that has hurt you. I'm going to open up this altar. They're going to sing. I'm going to ask you guys to come for up. Come up front. We'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. We'll have some people pray for you. And just begin to talk to God. You don't have to tell everybody your secrets. You don't have to do anything like that, but I'm asking you, be honest with yourself. Do not let these emotions that the enemy has planted inside your head, inside your heart, begin to grow to where it's, it's something that you can't handle anymore. Do not let these emotions grow to a place of manifestation where it begins to separate you from God, where it begins to separate you from his perfect will in your life. Begin to be honest with yourself. Let God do a work in you. Begin to talk to him. Begin to think about his throne. Begin to think about the things that he's brought, the things that he's repaired, the brokenness that he's put back together, the blessings that he's given you in life, and understand that there's a will for you. There's a will that God has for your life because you carry blessings. You carry the King of Kings in your hearts. Begin to talk to him. Something has to break. Turn down every 
I feel like God's telling me, I've seen that God has just given me that this word. I, the youth have come back from that retreat on fire. And the thing about fire is it begins to spread. When you see revival, revival becomes contagious. The kids are not up here because of all the problems they have. The kids are up here because they have a passion for Christ. They have a passion, they understand. They understand that the brokenness that they were feeling has been fixed. And what brings them to this altar is Jesus. That brokenness that they know that Christ can fix it. When you sit in your seat, you're telling Christ, I don't think you can fix what is wrong with me. If you want to fix the things in your life, the things in your heart, you have to respond. It's not a gimmick. It's not religious. You have to respond because it puts you in a place where you can begin to talk to God and it becomes contagious. If you want that, just that, that revival that they're experiencing, don't be ashamed to come to the front. Don't be ashamed to get fixed because that's where it happens. It happens up here. We could say God's everywhere. I could do it in my home. It happens amongst your brothers and sisters. Revival is a collective thing that begins to take place. If it's up here, come and get it. Come and get it. Come on, let's sing it out. Let's sing it out. Come on, church, let's sing it out. Begin to sing it out. The gates are opening. Come light a fire in me. Come light a fire in me. For all to see, oh Lord. Come light a fire in me. Come light a fire in me. Come light a fire in me. For all to see, oh Lord. Come light a fire. you 
something has to break something has to break something has to break right now in your name something has to break and I believe you'll get me to it I believe you'll lead me through it I believe that you will do it right now Something has to break I believe you'll get me to it I believe you'll lead me through it I believe that you will do it right now Something has to break I believe you'll get me to it I believe you'll lead me through it I believe that you will do it right now Something has to break Something has to break Right now in your name I'm going to ask if you would just give an attitude of, of prayer and reverence to the Holy Spirit um, We do have a, uh, our sister here, Soli Figueroa And the Figueroa family I saw uh, Jose and Anna as well and maybe uh, I don't see you but if you're in the room maybe you could come forward I want to get some of our pastors around uh, around the family but specifically praying for Soli uh, she, she you know she tragically lost uh, her son uh, Eddie and he was a part of this church and uh, really a friend to, to many of us and we just want to pray God's peace right now I mean it's just just tragic and, and horrific. Uh, but we want to pray over the family, the Figueroa family. If, if, if you would, just link your hearts here tonight. We're going to have some of our pastors around them. We're just going to minister to them for a little while. Um, but we wanted to corporately cover the Figueroa family in prayer. So would you guys pray with us here? Just allow us just a few minutes to minister.
presence of the Lord there is freedom in the presence of the Lord there is peace in the presence of the Lord and I pray I believe that tonight you felt some of those things you felt his freedom some of you have felt peace that you have not felt in a long time my goodness we're praying for a young man freedom on his life and it, the devil's attacking him demons are visiting him in his room the spirit of death we prayed for him and we believe tonight that there was freedom over the uh, that young man all across this place if we lift our hands we just thank the lord one more time father we thank you god for your goodness we thank you for your grace we thank you god for the for the healing lord all throughout this room father as you walked up and down these aisles god as you touched all the hearts, Lord, that surrender to you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the word that was spoken over us today. We pray, God, that you would give us, Lord, the understanding. We pray, God, that we would release that envy, that bitterness, all those things that hinder us from drawing closer to you. We lay it down at your feet. The enemy can't have that part of our hearts. He cannot have that part of our minds. We give it to you, Lord. We pray, God, that the healing that was given today, that we would walk in it, that we would walk in that freedom. We thank you, God, for this time together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Victory belongs to the Lord. And I'm going to walk in that victory. How many people feel victorious tonight? I'm so grateful to be in the presence of God. We want to thank you guys for joining us here at Reach Church. We ask that you join us Sunday morning at 9 or 11 uh, a.m. service. Have a great week and be blessed. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the message. To stay connected, follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. To not miss any of our online services and content, click the notification bell and like this video. We'll see you next time.